I was sitting on a stool at the counter in a small bar in the area near my hotel. I was in Boston, having just finished a deal that would leave me poor, but allow me to do whatever I wanted. The trick was figuring out how to do it and still stay rich. Confused? I hope so. This would mean that Roxy's lawyers are also confused. All this happened because I found out about my wife. This knowledge came to me on its own. I did not look for it. Things were complicated, to say the least, and my deal would only make things worse. Will make it worse for her. The place was almost empty, and that was one of the main reasons why I chose it. The bartender approached me after the only other customer had left the bar. It was still early, so I knew I wouldn't hold him back. He stopped in front of me, looked me over, then noticed that I had been here for some time. He said his name was Sam and asked my name. I thought, what do I have to lose? And said his name because I was impressed that he didn't look away. Nice to meet you, Sam. My name is Jim, Jim Evans. Thanks for the ears and beer. I don't want to go home tonight, and I don't want to spend time alone in a hotel room, so this place fits perfectly, even better than many others. If you're looking for luck, Jimbo, this is not the place to be. Better go to the sports bar down the street. He didn't even look embarrassed when he said it. Sam, look at me. We both know I look like something out of a nightmare, so do you think I'm hoping for luck? All I need is a couple of beers and some peace and quiet. Of course you don't count. Sam wiped down the bar in front of me, and instead of answering, he asked if I was ready for another beer. I nodded, and he brought me a cold Budweiser. It was my fourth of the evening, but who's counting? When he brought the beer, he said that I must have some story, and if I wanted, he would be happy to listen to it. I was hesitant. I was trying to work through my problems, but they were very personal, and I wasn't sure whether to share them with a stranger. I took the fresh beer and pushed the empty bottle away. Today I was in no hurry. I definitely didn't want to keep thinking about what was bothering me, but I didn't want to get blackout drunk either. The bartender took the empty bottle and placed it in the empty box, then wiped down the bar again before returning to his job of wiping glasses. Finally I thought, why not, and decided to tell him my story. Not that he cared, but I felt better about what I was saying and having a truly indifferent listener was a bonus. As I prepared to tell him my story, I admitted to myself that I wasn't really angry. This was the most unexpected thing. I should have been alarmed, on the verge of a breakdown, ready to jump out of my shoes, but there was none of that. I was just calm and cool. I guess that's what happens when your world falls apart. Sam took his rag, wiped down the bar in front of me, threw the rag over his shoulder, and leaned towards me. He was willing to listen as only a bartender can listen. My story. Well, Sam, it started nine years ago when I was in college. I was young, full of hope and ready to grab my luck. I was damn smart, as they say, and was ready to make my fortune. I was studying for a master's degree in engineering and was in my final year. I simply filled out the schedule since I needed to gain credits in additional disciplines. My main specialty was chemical engineering and I had already completed all the necessary courses in this specialty, so I took easy subjects. That's when I met her. She was studying to be a teacher, and I shared a course with her in my final year. It was a math course. For me, it was just a loan towards a minor in math. For her, it was part of the main program. She was failing terribly, and one day she saw one of my papers when the professor was handing out graded tests. I had a perfect result, of course, and she had 60%. I didn't pay attention to her as I left the class, but she was right behind me. As I walked out of the building, debating whether to go back to my apartment or stop by the student union for a Coke, she caught up with me and tugged at my sleeve. I stopped and turned to see who it was. When I saw her, I wanted to run away from fear. She was the most beautiful creature I had ever seen, and I always admired her from afar, so to speak. And now she was right in front of me and, apparently, wanted to talk to me. This was supposed to be a joke, a cruel prank to humiliate me, so I froze, waiting for the other shoe to drop. I expected her to do something for her friends, who were probably watching, waiting for her to humiliate the ugly guy. But she surprised me even more. She spoke to me. 
Sorry. I'm Roxanne Bowers, and I'm in your class. The same one you just came from. As if I didn't know that, Sam. Of course I knew it. I just forgot my name and where I am. I swallowed, repeated it again, and tried to find a drop of moisture to free my tongue, which was stuck to the roof of my mouth. Finally, I opened my mouth and croaked. I know. My name is Jay. Jim Evans. Hello, Jim. I would like to buy you a Coca-Cola and ask you a huge favor. Do you mind? Instead of trying to speak again, I just nodded yes. She started walking towards the student union, and I kind of tagged along next to her. As we walked, she started talking and telling me about herself. I listened with great attention so as not to miss a word. She continued talking all the way to the union, and I listened to the end. By the time we got there, I already knew everything about her. I knew her name, I knew where she was from, that she was the only child whose parents died in a car accident. She was raised by her aunt and uncle, who were quite good people. She was often left alone, but as a result she became quite independent. She did well in school, and her parents left her enough insurance benefits to enable her to go to college. She wanted to become a teacher, but in reality her dream was to meet a rich guy, get married and live in luxury. She thought she was a terrible person for it, but I said it wasn't that unusual for a lot of girls. She said that she didn't have a boyfriend and that she couldn't afford one because her studies took up all her free time, but she really wanted to finish her education. We grabbed a Coca-Cola, sat down at a table, and she finally asked me to help her with math and chemistry. She wasn't doing well in any of these subjects and wanted to make sure she could pass the exams. She saw that I always got perfect results, so she decided that I was the best candidate to be her tutor. She offered to pay me the market rate, and I hesitated a bit before agreeing. I didn't need the money for many reasons, not least because I was studying on a full scholarship with fees. The other reason was the fact of who I was. I looked exactly the same then as I do now, Sam. I've always been ugly, too thin, too tall, all bad things in one person. I wasn't beautiful. Hell, I wasn't even close to it. I had a long face and looked like a horse, which, by the way, was my nickname in school, and my character was so-so. I closed myself off when I met a girl, and in social situations I was generally lost. After I went through puberty, I started going bald and gained belly fat. Although I played a lot of sports, it did not change the situation. God gave me a body that no one else wanted. When I met her, I rarely left the house, didn't go on dates, wasn't in a fraternity, and never left campus for home. But despite this, and no matter how stupid it was, I did not want to miss this opportunity. We agreed that I would come to her house for an hour every weekday evening. I agreed, she gave me her address and phone number, and we parted. She smiled at me and held my hand for a few more seconds before turning and walking away. From her touch, the blood began to pulsate in my veins with such force that it scared me. I stayed where I was, watching her leave. This was enough for me, and I went back to my room, immersed in pink dreams of happiness. I started teaching her math in my own way. I thought I told you I was smart. Well, I'm kind of a genius, and math was one of my first loves. I taught her tricks and showed her how easy it is to solve problems when you realize that mathematics is a human invention that has rules. She caught on quickly and soon discovered that the course was actually easy once you understood the concepts. Her grades improved, and she did very well through the course. Then we got into chemistry. It was basic chemistry, and I just made her memorize structures, names, explained atomic structure, and how reactions balance and she gradually began to lose her fear of the unknown. Although she didn't do as well in chemistry as she did in math, she still passed with ease. During this time, we started talking about each other and what we wanted from life. Her dreams were quite simple. She wanted to be taken care of and enjoyed the material things life had to offer. She saw teaching only as a means to spend as little time as possible on work and hoped to fall in love with a rich man. She wanted freedom to travel and meet people. She was actually quite a shallow person, but I didn't care. What surprised me most was that she didn't seem to realize how beautiful she was. She thought she was pretty enough, but not too smart, and that turned guys off.
naive, maybe. I finally told her about myself, my ambitions to be the best at what I do, and my background. I was the only son of a self-sufficient millionaire. My father invented several self-contained power sources that could be used to power various vehicles. He patented his ideas and was the owner of Evans Industrial Factories, a large plant near Toledo that produced power supplies for the army. He had several contracts that were valid for many years, and each of them brought a good profit. Because my father worked constantly, I was raised by my mother, who was always there to make sure my world was in control and I was safe. She was also very smart and showed me the value of education. She homeschooled me through high school, and then, when my grades were at the top of my class, helped me get a full scholarship to Ohio State. I inherited mental abilities from both parents. They were both very smart, and their father was a real genius. The only problem was that my father was terribly ugly, as was my mother. They seemed to be attracted to each other precisely because no one else wanted to notice them, which was fine for them. They were in love with each other, and it was real, sincere love. I grew up in this world surrounded by love, and it made me a better person and a better man. However, along with my father's intelligence, I inherited his appearance, and my mother's appearance did not improve the situation. To say I was ugly would be an understatement. I've always been like this, and I knew it. But, as the Bible says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. I was happy with who I was. My world has always been reliably controlled thanks to my mom and dad. I had no thoughts other than about my education, and I strived for it with full dedication. I was happy and content until a drunk driver took them both from me. In one drunken act, he destroyed my safe and stable world and forced me into the light of the chaos that was life without them. I was 19 and just started college, but after this disaster I dropped out and returned home. This hit me hard, Sam, stronger than anything else in my life. They were my world, my source of love and laughter. When they left this world, my desire to live went with them. I thought about following them, but over time I came to understand that chance rules and we just have to live with it. So I did. Since my father did not have a will and my mother's will was the only document to guide me, I inherited everything. Suddenly, I was forced to take control of my father's business interests and try to understand what he had been doing all his life. He had years to become what he became. I only had a few days, weeks to do the same. But Sam, I got through it and discovered that I have a talent for knowing what to do and when is the best time to do it. I remembered who was who and who my father trusted, and I worked with these people until I took complete control of the business. I worked tirelessly for almost four years until I felt that everything was starting to make sense. When I was confident that the business could function without my constant supervision, I appointed one of the longtime managers to run the company. My father trusted him, and so did I. This left me time to go back to college. Believe it or not, Sam, I desperately wanted to complete my education. I was already rich then, but it didn't matter. Education was my goal, and I never gave up on my goals. My full scholarship was still valid, so I returned to Ohio State and began my mission to complete my degree. I was already 25 and had an income that ensured I would never have to work another day in my life. But Sam, that wasn't enough for me. My goal was to be the best, and I needed what college could teach me. Even though I was head and shoulders above everyone else, I took my time and studied everything I could while finishing my degrees. By that time I was already working on my master's degree. I have also used the labs and facilities at Ohio State to work on my own projects. By the time I graduated, I had several patents. Education was like the fuel that fueled my creative engines. That was my life until I met Roxy last year. This was the beginning of the greatest period of my life. She and I worked together to improve her grades, and while doing this, we started dating socially. I was constantly surprised when she would call me on the phone just to talk and share her day. I listened to her every word and stored it all in that place in my heart that I kept just for her. I was constantly on guard, waiting for some hint, some careless remark that would show that she thought about me like everyone else. I was too ugly. But that didn't happen and I began to believe that it didn't matter to her. 
I convinced myself. She changed my life that last year of college. After her, Sam, I could no longer imagine living alone. As the year went by, I finally worked up the courage to ask her out on a real date, and to my surprise, she said yes. We went out to dinner, went to a movie where she let me hold her hand, and then I walked her to the dorm. At the door she stood on her tiptoes and kissed me on the cheek before disappearing through the door. This was the start of a dream for me. We walked everywhere together, and when people saw us together and glanced at us, she simply ignored them. To my surprise, it seemed like she didn't even notice them. How rarely does this happen? We dated all year, and shortly before graduation I decided to propose to her. This would mean that she would continue her education, but I would buy a house in Columbus, and she could live with me, and I would help her as before. I made a plan and memorized all the questions she might ask when I proposed. I even considered the possibility that she might not want to marry me, because she was such a beauty and I was who I am. Perhaps she just wanted to remain friends. But she had never mentioned such a thing before, and I had the courage to think that she could turn a blind eye to it. I knew deep down that this could be a hurdle, but I had to try. That was me. I always took risks, no matter what they were. Sam, can you imagine my surprise when she said yes when I proposed to her? Well, pray tell. Look at me, and now look at her. She's amazing. She's everything I'm not. She is beautiful. She has the figure of a goddess. She is a natural blonde with blue eyes that you can drown in. And she has such a personality that everyone loves her. What about me? I'm a nerd, awkward, scary, with an ugly face and a body that needs work. When I start talking, most people's eyes roll. Look at yourself, for God's sake. It takes a lot of effort for you to just pay attention when I order a beer. You have to ask twice to make sure you even heard me. Sam was wiping that glass in his hands, as if he was trying to get rid of some kind of infection. He leaned towards me, trying to listen, but it was clear that it was difficult for him. His eyes returned to me every time after wandering away for a few seconds. There was no one in the bar, but there was still an hour and a half left before closing. He didn't have much choice but to stay close. To make things easier for him, and to give him a few more minutes before he got bored to death, I showed him a photo of her. It was the photo I kept in my wallet of her in a bikini on the beach on our honeymoon. I was in that photo too, but most people didn't even notice. I watched as his eyebrows raised and his mouth parted. Damn it, is this your wife? She is simply incredible. You're lucky. He could barely hold the glass in his hands. He wanted so badly to grab the photo. But this was impossible. I'm used to this kind of reaction. Yes, it's her. My beloved wife. My life partner. The woman of my dreams. Or rather, nightmares. She's a fucking sellout bitch and will soon be my ex-wife. When I finally get divorced, I'll give you her number. Now he wasn't looking at the photo anymore. The idea of getting her number and the realization that she was an easy girl became more important, so I put the photo down again and watched his eyes blur again as I started talking. Now that you know what she looks like and the proof of who I am is in front of you, I see. You understand where this is going, Sam. Of course, I treated her like a princess and let her have everything she wanted. I bought her a car, more clothes than she could ever wear, diamonds, fur coats, everything she even remotely wanted and I never stopped her from doing what she wanted to do. At first, she did very little. She was always home in the evening when I came over. There was always dinner on the table and a cold beer when I walked in the door. And when it was time to sleep, the sex was incredible. She couldn't do enough for me. Everything I asked, she did. And she let me do whatever I wanted with her. She said she never knew it could be this good. And I believed her, Sam. We shared everything. It was wonderful. Three years later, after trying for a long time to have a baby, we saw a fertility specialist. It turned out that we cannot have children. It was all about her, as the doctor said, and it greatly upset her. I offered her to adopt a child, to choose anyone she wanted, but she didn't want it. After that, she began to move away from me, but not physically. Not yet then. The sex was still great, but she started to pull away from me in other ways. We stopped laughing together, went out less often, spent time together, 
and she seemed indifferent to my work. She simply stopped caring about my life in general. I tried to talk to her about it several times, but she insisted that everything was fine. She pretended that everything was normal again, but after a day or two everything returned to normal. What bothered me the most was why she was angry at me over something that wasn't her fault. I never blamed her, I never said that it was a pity that we couldn't have our own child. I told her over and over again that I loved her and the fact that we couldn't have children didn't change anything. She seemed to accept this, but continued to distance herself from me. And then she began to find places to go and things to do that kept her busy until late in the evening. I was not happy with this, and I spoke out harshly, promising that if she could not be home in the evenings to be with me, we would have a problem that would have to be solved. She reduced her activity, but not completely. And then sex started to become less frequent. It happened so slowly that I didn't notice until one day I realized that I couldn't remember the last time we made love. When I mentioned this to her, she became angry and accused me of trying to remind her of her infertility. We had a terrible fight and nothing I said could calm her down. She screamed and cried and I didn't know what to do. We eventually stopped talking to each other and soon after she started sleeping in the guest room and our sex life stopped. Then suddenly things started to change again in the house. She began to laugh again, began to pay more attention to cooking, wanted to spend more time with me in the evenings, and began to take an interest in my work. Everything in the bedroom was back to normal, and she returned to our bed. Sex again became passionate and frequent, just as I loved. But her interest in my work and business increased so much that it began to worry me. I knew that before this, she was only interested in how much money I brought home and what she could buy with it. Now she wanted to know more. How do I deposit money into our accounts? How do I get money if I am the owner of the plant that brings it in? And other questions that the old Roxy would never have asked. Now Sam, I told you I'm very smart, a genius to be honest. It only took me a second to put two and two together and get a hundred. Think about it. No sex, and then it's sudden resumption, behavior change, questions about the plant and where the money comes from, treating me like a king. Doesn't that give you pause, Sam? Don't you think something is wrong here? Well, I thought about it, and it only took me a second to come to a conclusion. My beautiful wife is cheating on me and plans to steal money from me, hoping I won't notice. Perhaps she has other plans, but this was already enough to get my brain started working. A person who looks like me is always prepared for the possibility that someone might try to use him for money. If someone was kind to me, I always suspected something was wrong. Roxy's interest in me always surprised me, but I knew that I was what she always wanted, someone who would take care of her and provide her with everything she needed. The fact that she was able to look past my appearance was just a bonus, or so I convinced myself when we got married. Now I had to admit that all she wanted was my money. She didn't need me anymore. I had to admit that I loved her for accepting me, but that was before she decided to betray me. Now, even though I still loved her as much as before, it made me sad to realize that she was no different from anyone else I had met over the years. I just needed to be grateful for the time I had with her. She was beautiful and everything any man could dream of. I was with her for almost five years, four and a half of which were happy, but now it's over. It took me almost a month to come to terms with this, Sam. It hurt at first. Anger began to build, and I screamed at the fate that made me who I am. I spent nights lying in bed asking God why he gave me hope, and then took it away. It was cruel and inhumane. He took my mother and father from me and left me to survive. Now he was taking Roxy but eventually the person I was took over and the pain began to fade. One day, after waking up from a restless sleep full of questions and self-pity, I simply gave up. I was a fool and convinced myself that someone like her could truly love me for who I was. Great, I'll do what I have to do. I won't bore you with the details, Sam. Just know that I used one of my inventions, combined with one of the power supplies my father developed, to find out what she was really up to. Everything she said or did from the time I left for work to the time she or I returned home was recorded and stored in a small memory cube no larger than a pack of matches. I placed it in her purse, 
the one she never left at home, sewn inside the lining where she would never find it. The device had a range of 100 feet in any direction, even when the bag was closed. I invented it for use with one of the power supplies we were making for satellites. Size and weight were critical parameters, so this device was as small and light as our capabilities allowed, and that was damn little. All I had to do when she got home was sit down at the laptop, turn it on, activate the program, which sent a signal to the device in her bag, and then the data was downloaded to my computer. All this took 10 seconds. After this, the device's memory was cleared, and it was ready to collect data again until the next boot. Everything worked perfectly, and I was in business. She had no idea that I could do this, or that I could even suspect her of anything. Life with me convinced her that she was so beautiful that she could get whatever she wanted from any man she met along her privileged path. I was no exception, or at least that's what she thought. She was unlucky. My life experience was completely different. I had to work, fight, or beg to get what I wanted. Humiliating situations were nothing new to me. I was much stronger than her. I could accept the pain that was inevitably coming. I got used to pain even in my early years. The truth turned out to be exactly as I suspected. She was seeing a guy named Roy during the day while I was at work. They met once or twice a week, never at our house, always at his. Since the data download also gave me the GPS coordinates of all the places she stayed for more than 30 minutes, I could combine that with the audio recording to determine where he lived. My computer gave me the address, and I did a reverse Google search to determine it was a residential building. I listened to the audio recording, and what I heard confirmed my worst fears. She and Roy had sex, and it looked like they had done it several times. At first it was difficult to listen, knowing that it was my wife making these sounds. But I later noticed that although Roxy was seeing him once or twice a week, in the six weeks that I was listening, they only had sex twice. Another strange note, when she said something like, yes, or stronger, stronger, she didn't sound the same as when we were together. I confess when Roxy and I made love. I listened to the tapes over and over again, and eventually came to the conclusion that Roxy abstained from sex as much as she could. Which led me to the question, why did she have sex with someone if it clearly didn't satisfy her? Why did she cheat on me with someone who couldn't satisfy her? I didn't have an answer. Genius or not, I couldn't solve this riddle. But that didn't matter anymore. She cheated, and that was a fact. Over the next two weeks, I found this apartment building, learned that Roy was Roy Baldwin, an attorney with First National Bank and Trust with whom I did most of my business. Finally, I found out that he knew my account numbers with the company. He told Roxy that he had used his accountant friend to open a fake account in my company's name using the numbers available to him. You see, Sam, he was able to transfer funds from other accounts to the fake one without coming to my attention, because if my accounts were checked, the total amounts would remain the same. Now I understand everything, Sam. She decided to use Roy as a weapon to steal my money and leave me with nothing. Sex was her tool and she knew that Roy could not refuse her if she offered him what all men desire. When they are ready, he will empty my accounts by transferring the money to a fake account and then withdraw the funds. I immediately understood what this meant and knew that he could do exactly what he claimed. And my problem was that Roxy seemed to not only be aware of all of this, but also participate in it. Her betrayal was complete. At home, I tried my best not to tell Roxy that I knew about her betrayal, but genius does not make a person indifferent, Sam. She continued to try to maintain a semblance of normalcy, but I still became withdrawn. I wasn't social and my broken heart was too painful to allow me to pretend to be content and happy. My behavior began to bother her, and I noticed that she was frowning more and more often. She asked me about it, but I said that I was just tired and that work was exhausting me. I also mentioned that business was not going well and that things might start to slow down. I knew she was starting to worry, and I assumed that her guilt was causing her to ask questions about my behavior. She turned into a tigress in the bedroom, and honestly, it almost drove me crazy. It was amazing, Sam, how much she seemed to really care. She was very good.
there was a lump in my throat from emotions that I thought I had under control. To give myself time, I stopped for a minute, picked up an empty bottle of Budweiser, and Sam took it and brought me another cold one. He wiped down the counter as usual, placed the new beer on a clean paper coaster, and picked up another glass to wipe it clean. He looked thoughtful for a second and finally looked up to ask a question. This surprised me because I thought he was just ignoring me as I talked and talked. Let me ask you this, Jimbo. Why did she have sex with a guy who didn't satisfy her and still have sex with you who satisfied her? And why did she first stop having sexual relations with you and then resume them again? I can't wrap my head around this. Something is wrong here, something suspicious. I was pleased. He got the point, so he really listened. I wanted to hug him with joy, but I remembered that according to the rules of etiquette, you should not hug your bartender. But in the state I was in, his interest was like a ray of light in the darkness. I was amazed by this guy. Honestly, I was. Maybe I'll think about giving him a little bonus at the end of the day. Great question, Sam. I asked myself this again and again. Why did she ruin everything and let this guy have sex with her if it didn't make her happy? Better yet, why did she continue to sleep with me, who could drive her crazy? Great question, yes sir, a damn good question. And I'll tell you the answer. First of all, remember what I told you about Roxy's purpose in life. She wanted to be taken care of and to have everything she wanted. Since we got married, she has never taught. She was a professional shopaholic. Every day brought something new. Clothes, shoes, jewelry, underwear, perfume, you name it, she had it. She was insatiable. She never had enough, and I never refused her anything. Never. But this was not enough for her. Here's what's strange. When she found out she couldn't have children, Roxy began to wonder how I felt about that. Although I told her that this was normal and that we could adopt a child, she did not believe me. Can you imagine? She thought I was just stalling for time. I wait until I find someone else who agrees to marry someone like me and give me children. She convinced herself that I was going to leave her. Now, Sam, think about it. Someone as beautiful as Roxen thought that someone as ugly as me, born a loser in terms of looks, would leave someone like her. Oh, I see you raise your eyebrows. I see the grin on your face. You think I'm talking nonsense, don't you? But it's true. I heard her tell this to several of her friends when they were shopping. She was sure that I was going to divorce her as soon as it was confirmed that my mistress was pregnant. My lover Sam, how do you like that? And where did she get this from? Yes, from our lawyer friend. He told her that I had contacted him to inquire about the divorce and how much it might cost me. He said that I want to leave her with nothing. Ha, now we know why she had sex with him. Simple, understandable but damn wrong. I stopped for a moment, tears welling up in my eyes and starting to fall from my chin. I put my head down on the counter and just started crying. Everything was still too fresh, the pain and loss. Sam, bless his heart, said nothing while I lost my dignity in front of him. He simply took the half-empty Budweiser and replaced it with another. I heard someone walk up to the counter and Sam tell him, fuck off, but I couldn't lift my head. Finally, I gathered my strength and straightened up. Sorry, Sam. I'm sorry about that. I took the offered paper towel and wiped my face, trying to regain my sense of self-worth. It was hard, damn hard to say it out loud. But it's true. No need to apologize, Jimbo. Guys here lose their temper all the time. At least you have a damn good reason. Hell, I'd cry too if I lost a woman like her. So go ahead and carry on. You told me why she slept with that freak. Yes, sorry. In general, the thought that I would leave her turned out to be too difficult for her. She was afraid of losing everything she had. Money, cars, clothes, everything. She loved all these things probably more than she loved me. Oh, I guess I always suspected it, but now it was official. When I started recording her conversations, I overheard one she was having with her accountant friend. The accountant told Roxy to make sure she knew where all my accounts were so that in the divorce she would know where all the money was buried. Roxy heard her and, of course, took it seriously. Now about Roy from the bank. It was the lawyer who told her about my intention to divorce her. 
he waited until he hooked her. After talking with her accountant, she went back to the bank to see Roy. He was waiting for her, and when he said that he was handling all my accounts, he convinced her that he was the one she needed. She started working on him to seduce him. That was her goal, and of course, she didn't know that he was just letting her think she could do it, just using her. Of course, he reluctantly agreed, with the promise of sex. That's when she stopped having sexual relations with me and began to become more friendly. Before this, she was just trying to ignore me to make it harder for me to get a divorce. That's what she thought. She started meeting him after work for coffee, then a couple of cocktails, and finally started hinting that she was ready to meet him for more. It took her almost two months, all the while pretending he wasn't interested, but eventually he invited her to his apartment, and they slept together. I learned this when I started recording their conversations. She tried to convince him that she was attracted to him and that they could run away together if he could steal enough money from me. She worked on it, especially right after sex. He quickly agreed and opened a fake account. She hooked him, and he caught her too. What a stupid couple. So she didn't even like sex with him. Was she just doing it to get him to do what she wanted? And all this time he was just playing with her. She had sex with him for money. Damn it, Jimbo. This makes her a high-class prostitute in my eyes. Beautiful, but still a bitch. You got it right, Sam. A beautiful, high-class sales bitch who wanted more than just money. She took my heart and tore it to shreds, and I don't know why. Even if she believed I was going to divorce her, I would still give her enough to live in luxury. More than enough. God, how could she even think of me like that? Sam tapped me on the shoulder, told me the bar would be closing soon, and suggested I get a cup of coffee before I left. He was right, and I accepted his offer when he brought the coffee. I thought later that this was one of the kindest gestures anyone has done for me in a long time. Good old Sam. A kind heart and a good listener. Someone who actually listened to me. I finished my coffee, washed my face in the dirty restroom, and returned to say goodbye. When I left, Sam was $200 richer cheaper than therapy. I walked the short way to my hotel. There were several messages waiting for me at the front desk. One was from my lawyer. It simply said that the documents were ready and we could sign them in the morning. The second one was from Roxy and she asked me to call her. There were three more messages, all from her, and each one asking me to contact her. I tore them up and left only one from my lawyer. I took the elevator up to my room and washed my face to remove the sticky tear marks. I sat down at the table and looked at the phone. I reached out to him three times before I finally convinced myself there was no point in calling. I turned off the light and went to bed. The next morning I was woken up by a call. I answered it without hesitation. It was Roxy. I thought about not saying anything, but I couldn't do that even to her. I listened. Jimmy. Jimmy, why didn't you return my calls? What's going on, Jim? I don't like it when you don't call and let me know you're okay. I was waiting for your call last night when you returned. You didn't call. I waited all evening. I left messages, but you didn't call back. Jimmy, what happened? I thought about lying to her and putting it off until I got home. My lawyer advised me to do this. My mind told me to do this. My conscience even told me to do this. So what did I do? You guessed it right. I listened to my broken heart and decided to give her something to worry about. I didn't know where to call you, Roxy. I didn't know whether to call you at home, where you could be with Roy, or at his apartment. I just didn't know, so I didn't call. I heard a sigh, then a loud scream. I listened, but I heard it as if she had dropped the phone. I continued listening and heard nothing more. I hung up and sat down, trying to catch my breath. My chest was tight, my breathing was fast and shallow, and I was having a full-blown anxiety attack. It seemed like I was going to die. Heart attack. But I was unlucky. I came to my senses. I quickly showered, got dressed, and called my lawyer, Floyd. He was already on his feet and checking his documents. He said he would meet me downstairs in a few minutes, and we would call the person we needed to meet. He seemed pretty pleased with himself, which made me happy. When Floyd was happy, it always meant that I would get a lot of money. 
With this thought, I went downstairs and had breakfast. When Floyd joined me, I was already sitting back with a cup of hot, strong coffee and feeling pretty good. We went to the office of the person we were going to discuss the deal with, and within an hour we had completed the sale of 49% of Evans Industrial Factories to Harrison Powers Investments and named a new president and CEO of the company. I still owned 51% of the shares, the controlling interest, but I gave the new president written permission to run the company as he saw fit and transferred my 51% into a closed account for a period of five years. In other words, I had no right to control that 51% during that time. In addition, I signed a contract stating that I could not sell my share of the company for a period of no less than six and no more than 10 years. For the 49% of shares that I sold, I will receive royalties every month, the amount of which will be credited to a closed account. Payments must be deferred for five years. In other words, I was no longer paid as CEO. I have not received income from the sale of the company for at least five years. I could not liquidate my share of the company during this time, and I transferred 49% ownership and all operating accounts into the name of the new CEO, and the transfer of these funds was completed last night. The remaining 51% was also transferred to this closed account. Roy Baldwin and First National Bank and Trust no longer had access to these funds. To be fair, Floyd took what we had in our personal accounts at the time of my departure and divided it in half. He left half in an account that Roxy had access to and remained open and transferred the rest to a separate account for me. Once this money runs out, what will I do to generate money over the next five years? Good question. I decided that I could probably make some good money if I entered the free market. I knew people, I knew who needed my knowledge and who was ready to hire me. If someone were to check my income for divorce purposes, it would be virtually zero, but my earning potential was enormous. How do you like that? I was willing to bet that for Roxanne these opportunities were too far in the future to satisfy her immediate greed. It's funny, isn't it? And if the divorce requires me to share my assets and income with her, my income will be very modest. Just enough to survive, and my assets were legally protected. No way to ruin this. Floyd and I went back to the hotel to check out. He was going back home to Columbus, and I had no specific destination. I just wanted to leave, anywhere to forget the pain of losing Roxanne. Despite everything she did to me, despite all the pain and suffering, the years she gave me were more than I could ever hope to have. Did she ever love me? I wasn't sure. However, I could pretend that she was in love and that we had good years together. If she could have a child, perhaps everything would remain the same. In my room, a flashing light signaled a message, and I assumed it was from Roxy. I sat and looked at him, trying to decide whether to answer. In the end, I had no choice. I've always been very curious about everything. I was curious how Roxy would handle this. All her plans and intrigues were in vain. The money was gone, and now there was no way she could get more. Everything is gone. That alone made me want to hear what she had to say. I picked up the phone and the counter gave me a message. Jim, please call me as soon as you get back. Roxy. According to the clerk, they received five messages, all identical, before asking her to stop calling. She didn't stop and was reported to the phone company. The calls continued. I put my head in my hands, trying to calm my heart, which began to beat wildly. After everything she did, I couldn't stop loving her. That was my problem. I was used to being an object of ridicule, a victim of cruel and evil words, a freak that everyone tried not to look at. Roxy changed all that and made it unimportant for almost five years. Years when I didn't care what others thought. Roxy loved me, or at least that's what I believed. But regardless of whether it was true or not, I believed it, and that was important. This was really important. For this, I was grateful to her. I called home and Roxy answered the first call. Hello, Jim, is that you? Please tell me it's you. Her voice was tense and hoarse. Apparently she had been crying and her throat had become rough. This was not uncommon for her. She usually had a deep, sexy voice, and when she was upset, she sounded even sexier. Yes, Roxy, it's me. 
your buffoonish husband, circus freak. What do you need? Jim, please come home. We need to talk. I want to see you and explain myself. Please, Jim, if you love me, come home. It's a joke. If I love you, of course I love you. How can I not love? I loved you from the first moment I saw you in that college class. That's why it hurts so much. I loved you with all my heart, and you and your lover betrayed me for money. All I meant to you was just a source of income and a free ride. How disgusting it must have been for you to look at me every day. How you must have laughed to yourself every time we made love, thinking what a fool I was for believing that someone like you could love someone like me. No, 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 you should come home and let me talk to you. Jim, please, I don't care anymore. You can hate me all you want, but you have to come back to me. You must. You don't understand. You're wrong. You're wrong. The only thing I did wrong was convincing myself that you really cared about me. But now I know that it was all for what I could give you. All those things I bought you were just things. You could have gotten everything you wanted if you had just stayed with me. But apparently this has become too much of a challenge for you. Pretending to love me, accepting me, making love to me. Damn it, eventually you couldn't take it anymore. You just stopped having sex with me. That must have been a relief for you, didn't it? There's no need to sleep with me anymore before you suspect that I might start to suspect something. That's why you started having sex with me again, isn't it? No, this is not true. You have it all wrong, Jim. You got it all wrong. Please come home. I wish you were here so I could talk to you face to face. Please, Jim, please. Face to face. What a joke. How could you look into my eyes and pretend to love me? God, how disgusting that must have been for you. But you were good. I have to give you credit. You led me by the nose, and it was a real attraction. But here's the joke, Roxy. I loved you, and I enjoyed it, and I will never forget the time you gave me. Even if it was all a lie, I will still remember it and smile. Thank you for this. I hung up and unplugged the phone cord from the socket. I'm done with this. It was too painful to continue, so I ended it. I decided to stay one more night while I decided where I wanted to go. I had enough money in my wallet to last me at least a week if I checked out of this hotel and found a studio somewhere in a not-too-expensive area. I decided to go back to the bar where Sam worked and see if he wanted to talk some more. Damn it, I had nothing better to do than to do this. Sam hadn't started his shift yet, so I decided to have a couple of beers and then look up a few places on the computer and pick one. I took a notepad with me and sat in one of the booths, making a list of people I knew and the places they were. This list turned out to be quite impressive. I was amazed at the number of people I knew, especially those I considered friends. It made me proud to have made so many contacts. While ordering a second beer, I took out my laptop and connected to the internet. It's strange that even a cheap bar like this has wireless internet. I checked my email and found several new messages, all from Roxy. Since when did she become so advanced at using email? She even had her own address. This was news to me. But there seemed to be a lot about Roxy that I didn't know. Her contempt for me, for example. Her cheating is another one. And finally, her obvious greed for money. I opened the first few messages and found that they were all the same. Jim, please come home. I can explain everything. Of course she could. It will sound something like this. Dear Jim, I just wanted money and was willing to turn a blind eye to your ugly face and body and pretend. Isn't that worth something? Actually, yes, it was worth it. And I gave her everything I could. Everything she asked for, I gave her. But this was not enough. She wanted everything, even without me. I deleted all the messages except the last one. I opened it just out of curiosity and got a surprise. It was longer and more detailed. Jim, I know what you're thinking, and you're probably right, but not about how I feel about you. This is where you are very wrong. I also fell in love with you at first sight, on that first day that we met. You were so sweet, honest, and willing to help me. I fell in love with you that day, and I never stopped loving you. I saw only your inner beauty, your soul. Nothing about my appearance has ever bothered me. I only saw the man I love, and he was beautiful. 
but you're wrong about the money. I don't need your money. I need you. Roy was a mistake that I regret. Now I understand that he used me to get into your accounts. I gave him the information he asked for because he convinced me that you were discussing divorce with him and were going to leave me with nothing. I didn't care about the money, but I hoped that if I helped him, you wouldn't have enough money to leave me for another woman. Sex was just a way to gain his trust. I never enjoyed it, you have to believe it. It was just a means to get him to trust me. You probably never believed that you were a great lover. You told me that you didn't have sex before we got married. Well, I have, and no one compares to you. I always told you this, but you didn't seem to believe me. It's funny that now I understand that you never believed what I told you, that I love you, that I don't care what you look like, that your money only gave me the opportunity to be beautiful for you. You were so insecure, and I didn't know it. I just believed that you loved me, and I loved you. But maybe that's fair. I didn't believe you when you said you didn't care if we didn't have children. I thought you wanted our children, and when I found out I couldn't give them to you, I literally went crazy. Jim, please come home and let me talk to you. If after this you want to get a divorce, I will not challenge it. I will not demand anything other than what I brought into our lives. You can keep everything else. Even the clothes, shoes, and jewelry I wore to make you proud of me. All this means nothing to me without you. You have to believe it. You have to believe it. Please come home. With love, Roxy. I reread this letter several times. Could any of this be true? Could she really mean what she wrote? The more I thought about it, the more it seemed to me that she was still trying to deceive me, trying to get me to come back so he can use his beauty and sex to win me back again. Now that I took all her money, she wanted me back. That must be it. I was still thinking about it when Sam arrived. I was so lost in thought that I was startled when he came over, sat down on the chair opposite me, and waited for me to notice him. I raised my head in surprise when he cleared his throat. Hey Jimbo, here again. I see you are using the internet they installed last month. Damn, I think you're the first and only one to use it. Our clients aren't too interested in that kind of stuff, if you know what I mean. And yes, how did it go today? If I remember correctly, you had big plans to get back at that bitch. Am I right? You're right, Sam, and you have a good memory. I'm surprised you remember what we talked about. Most people forget about me as soon as they leave my side. I'm easy to forget. You underestimate yourself, Jimbo. You may not look good, but you are an interesting person. And damn, most of us aren't handsome, and I know for a fact that some of the guys who come here are either so ugly or so stupid or evil that they have to settle for cheap bitches. So consider yourself lucky. You had a real woman for many years. I thought about Sam's words and made a decision. I moved the laptop closer to him and turned the screen so he could read the open letter from Roxy. Read this, Sam. Tell me what you think. And by the way, as of today, I'm broke. I don't have a penny in my accounts and won't for many years. Roxy got everything she could, and I didn't even divorce her. Remember, I'm pretty smart, and she pissed me off, so the money is safely hidden so that she and an army of lawyers can't get it. Don't even think about asking for your tip back, Jimbo. I've already spent it. Sam laughed, but pulled the laptop closer to him and began to read. I watched as his eyes ran over the lines Roxy had written. He read everything, then went back and read it twice more before returning the laptop to me. Damn it, Jimbo. I don't know her at all, other than what you told me, but this letter makes me think. She seems sincere. Do you think there's a chance that she actually means what she writes? That's the question, isn't it, Sam? This is the million-dollar question. How should I know? All my life I have been wary, suspicious of anyone who was even slightly kind to me. I was always waiting for the trap to spring, for me to be humiliated again. Even when I first met Roxy, I was waiting for her to make a fool of me. But this did not happen, and I began to trust her. For the first time in my life, I trusted someone. After my parents died, I didn't expect to find anyone I could trust again. But she came into my life. Sam, all I know is that for almost five years I was normal. I had someone who loved me for who I was. 
oh, I suspected she was attracted to my money, but even with that, she seemed really into me. I thought it was a good deal. I provided her with money so she could buy what she wanted and needed, and she provided me with a home and a refuge where I could be like everyone else. I had a house, a wife and everything that goes with it. I was truly happy. Well, Jimbo, if I were you, I'd give it a chance. What's the worst that could happen? You're broke, money doesn't matter anymore, and she's left with nothing. She can't take anything in the divorce, and you have nothing to give her if she stays. And you've already convinced yourself that it's all over, so you have nothing to lose. I thought about it and decided Sam was right. He's absolutely right. Everything I suspected Roxy wanted was lost. She will have to wait at least five years to get anything again. I couldn't afford to keep our house, our cars, anything we owned. Everything had to be sold to pay off debts. Not even a lawsuit could destroy the documents I signed today. Floyd spent a large amount of my money to make this possible. I pulled up my laptop, hit reply to Roxy's email, and started typing. Roxy. I took steps so that my money no longer mattered. No matter what happens, my money is gone and your lawyers won't be able to get to it. You can sue me for child support, for anything, but you won't get anything. I promise you it's true. I don't know how I can believe anything you say now. You finally met all my expectations. You deny it, but the facts speak for themselves. You've been able to successfully deceive me for many years, so I'm pretty sure you can do it now. But you gave me almost five wonderful years before you took them away. That's the only reason I'll give you an hour to explain why you broke my heart. I'll be home tomorrow at six in the evening. I'll listen to everything you have to say. Jim. I stared at the screen, foolishly waiting for an answer, before reminding myself that she was most likely not sitting there waiting for my answer. I had barely convinced myself of this when I received a notification of an incoming letter. It was from Roxy. Jim, please hurry up. I'll be waiting. With love, Roxy. I closed the laptop and went to the bar, where Sam was still wiping dirty glasses. I wondered for a moment how they could get so dirty when the bar seemed empty most of the time. Just like last time, I spent the evening chatting with Sam, and he and I began to form a friendship of sorts. At least he'll remember me. After all, I was pretty memorable, if only in an ugly way. That night I returned to my room and slept like a baby. My world has changed over the past few days, but I have dealt with the change and ended up where I wanted to be. Tomorrow will be the first day of the rest of my life. I returned from Boston and walked into work the next morning to say goodbye to a lot of good people. The father hired most of them, trained, directed, and scolded some. I felt that I had gained their respect and trust after taking over the leadership, which was an achievement that many failed to achieve. I explained that the company was still stable and would continue to operate. I told them that some things will change, but there is no need to be afraid. I have taken steps to protect them for these important five years. They listened, they doubted, but they returned to work with some confidence. It was important to me that they trusted me. I spent the rest of the day talking on the phone with people I knew around the world, people who would most likely want to use my talents for their own purposes. By four o'clock in the afternoon, I had appointments with two gentlemen in Pantarinas, Costa Rica. This city is on the coast, in the Gulf of Nicoya, near the Pacific Ocean, and promised simple housing for the single American. Tickets were supposed to be ready by noon the next day. Now that my future was determined, I needed to decide what to do with Roxy. Divorce was the easiest option. Now that my money was protected, she would get nothing in any lawsuit. If I gave her everything I had now, she would get the house, cars, all the clothes and jewelry. Everything that seemed necessary and loved to her. It would be a fair price for the best five years of my life. At least since my parents were taken away from me. At six o'clock, I arrived at what had once been our home. I knocked on the door. Roxy opened it almost immediately after I knocked and stepped aside for me to enter. I did so, and she closed the door behind me quickly walking around me to stand in front of me. How can I describe Roxy? How can I describe a woman who, in my opinion, was the most beautiful in the world? I have never seen her through other people's eyes. 
For me, she has always been beautiful. I knew she was beautiful. I had confirmation from others who often doubted my words. That she was perfect in every aspect was also confirmed by others. She was tall, at least for a woman. She had a body that made men drool and women cursed. Her face was like something straight out of a Michelangelo painting. A smile that promises the world, a look that assures you that this could be yours, and eyes that take your breath away. All this was once mine, and all this was my proof that I deserved something in this life, at least in her eyes. And now she stood in front of me, and none of these characteristics were visible. What I saw was a simple woman who was lost, unsure of her place in the world, and suffering internally. Yes, I could see it. I could always see what lay beneath the surface. It was both a curse and a gift. I always believed all these years that she truly loved me, that she never saw me as anything other than her husband. This is what ultimately destroyed me. I always believed that I could see her true essence. And now, maybe what I saw wasn't what I thought it was. Maybe this was just another game designed to betray me again. Roxy walked into the living room, which was located just off the hallway. We used it for meetings with guests, for people who dropped in for brief conversations. We've never used it for just the two of us, but this was a special occasion. I followed her, watching her walk ahead of me and remembering the first time I watched her, knowing that I would see her every night from now on. This memory caused a lump in my throat. I swallowed several times, trying to get rid of it. Roxy sat down in one of the two chairs in front of the huge fireplace, which was not burning at the moment. She motioned for me to sit in the other chair next to her. I sat down and turned to face her. Your time, Roxy. I'm here to hear what you have to say. She nodded, a look of determination on her face, one that I remembered from many math and chemistry classes. It wasn't an expression I've seen since. She raised her eyes to meet mine and began to speak. First of all, everything I wrote in my letter is true. All. I love you and always have. I never thought differently when I was with you. I don't care what you look like or think you look like. I love you. I love how and who you are. Nothing will ever change that. Maybe I haven't told you this often enough. It was enough for me to know that it was true, and perhaps I was wrong, and I really loved the way you made love to me. You were the best I have ever known, and I enjoyed every minute with you. I loved holding you after that feeling you breathing heavily, all wet with sweat. The fact that I could make you feel this way was a huge pleasure for me. That man, Roy, was never a threat to you. He was a pathetic man who used my fear and my ignorance to get what he wanted. Roxy stopped there, wiped her eyes with the small handkerchief she was holding in her hand, and looked down at the floor. She seemed to gather her thoughts, then continued. When I found out I couldn't have a child, it almost killed me. I took it very hard and couldn't come to my senses for a long time. You tried to help me, but it's my fault that I couldn't accept your help. I felt like I had failed you, that you would see me as a failure. You have to understand, Jim, that all I have is my looks. You are smart, confident, you do everything for me. From the very beginning, you were the one who helped me get through college. Since then, you have always helped me make decisions, so when I couldn't even give you a child, my confidence disappeared. I was afraid that you would start looking for someone else. This thought began to eat away at me, and I eventually convinced myself that you would look for another woman who could give you children. This thought began to eat me from the inside, and all I could think about was that you don't need me anymore. This is exactly the state I was in when Roy contacted me and told me a lie about you wanting a divorce. Somehow he knew that I felt insecure. He eventually gave me a plan to steal your money. I was in such a state that I thought that if you don't have money, you won't be able to leave for another woman. I know it sounds ridiculous, but I wasn't in my right mind at the time. I was panicked, lost, afraid of losing you. Roy used this. He wanted me as much as all the other men I had met. I understood this and decided to use it to force him to steal money from you. I thought this was my only way to protect our marriage. It was a mistake that I will regret for the rest of my life. Roxy stopped again. I decided to pour her a glass of water to calm her down as her anxiety was growing. Listening to her, 
I began to feel a little hope as the picture she painted began to take shape. Everything she said was true so far, including everything I learned through my observations. She didn't try to lie or change facts to make herself less guilty. This made the strongest impression on me. I watched as she took a sip of water, then put the glass down and turned to me. I slept with Roy twice, but I didn't like it both times. He never guessed, but he was sure that he was a great lover and that he could take me with him when he stole the money. I didn't want to have anything to do with him, but I wanted you to be left without money, at least for a while, to convince you not to leave for another woman who could give you children. Roxy stood up, looked at me, and nodded as if to say, There, I said everything I wanted. I looked at her, and at that moment I made a decision about what I would do. All this time I was thinking, planning, plotting how to make her life harder, but that didn't even matter now. When I looked at her face, I knew what I had to do. Deep down, where the real me lived, I had no other choice. No choice. Everything I've been through, all the abuse I've endured from others, all the pain and loss I've endured, all the gifts God has given me to compensate for it, all it all made my decision easy. Roxy, I want to ask you a few questions. Will you answer them honestly? She didn't even think about it. I will never lie to you again, Jim. I swear to you. Fine. Do you love me, Roxy? Yes, Jim. I love you with all my heart. Do you understand that I have no money now and won't for many years? Yes, and I don't care. I have tickets to Costa Rica to meet two guys who want to hire me to work on their project. It's not the nicest place to live, but it's what I want. I'm glad you have a place you want to go. I'm sure you'll do a great job with this. They must know this if they invited you. Will you come with me if I ask? Knowing that life there will be very difficult without all the amenities you are used to? I will give up everything if you ask. I will follow you wherever you go without a second thought. I will never be with another man again, even if you don't take me back. I swear this to you. Like I said, I had no other choice. I lived my life as a person who was mocked, who endured cruel and evil words, as a freak who everyone turned away from. I was someone who experienced solitude and learned to enjoy my own company. I grew up like this and lived my life with no regrets until Roxy came into it. Since then I have become a different person. Normal, with a normal life and a beautiful wife whom others admired. I was envious of what I had, and I got used to it, that I could be normal like everyone else. I had friends, people who came to my house to be with us. Normal in every way. I said a simple, quiet prayer then. It sounded like this. Please don't take this away from me again. I looked at Roxy standing in front of me and extended my hand to her. Roxy, I want you to come with me. I want you to be by my side for the rest of our days. Do you agree? She came up to me, hugged me tightly and said, Yes, I agree. I promise you that I will never let you down again. I promise you will never regret this day. That was five years and three days ago. Yesterday, Roxy, myself, and our three children returned to the United States after receiving a call from Floyd. It appears that the first of the guaranteed payments arrived in the special account on time. There was already a decent amount of money in this account, since it was opened five years ago with money from accounts that were then closed. The payments that began to arrive after five years were very large and will continue without delay. Roxy knew how much money was in these accounts, but all she said was, it would be good to start college funds for the kids. Costa Rica's climate appears to have had a beneficial effect on fertility. Roxy became pregnant less than a month after we moved there and gave birth to a beautiful baby girl nine months later. A year and a half later, we had twins. As our family grew larger, I borrowed some money to buy us a bigger house although it was still modest by any standards. But we all loved this place and were going to return there as soon as we resolved all the issues. I joined Roxy and the kids at the motel where we were staying. Have you got everything settled? She asked as I sat down in one of the chairs by the pool. Everything is settled. Floyd is very pleased. He will make good money representing our interests. Fine. When are we leaving? I want to return home as soon as possible. 
I thought you would want to see the house and maybe the places we left. Don't want to spend some money? Buy a new house here in the States? Don't be a smartass. I just want to go home. I think we need to think about getting a little brother for our three girls. What about money? Don't you wonder how much we have now? No, I just want to go home. I laughed and decided to stop teasing her. We can leave as soon as you're packed. Stupid, I still haven't unpacked. Roxy stood up, kissed me deeply, and went to get the kids ready to leave. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one.